Thanks. And uh, yeah, so today we have like three super awesome uh, panelists. And first, let me go with, uh, we have Professor Alice Gorman, and she is popularly known as Dr. Space Junk on Twitter, and she's a space archaeologist. So if you want to know what exactly a space archaeologist does, do check out her super cool, super awesome book, which is called Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe. It's really fabulous. Um, and so she, uh, Alice is based in Adelaide, and she has also worked extensively in indigenous heritage management and advises government departments and local councils in Australia. So thank you so much for taking the time out, Alice, and welcome to the panel. It's my absolute pleasure, and I'm so excited to be with this amazing group on Valentina's Day. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Alice. And next we have uh, Dr. Anika Mellis. And hello, Anika. It's the uh, first time I'm meeting you. It's wonderful to meet you finally. And Anika is a microbiologist, engineer, and a health scientist. So that is some fabulous combination. Uh, and she has been an analog astronaut in the Austrian Space Forum. So she carried out a lot of Marsh, uh, Martian simulations on Earth in uh, the remote areas under really difficult climatic conditions. And she is uh, dedicated and strongly interested in sustainability and the sustainable development goals. So that's also quite interesting and will bring us to a lot of questions eventually. And welcome to the panel, Anika. Um, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I'm really honored to be here in this um, amazing group today. Um, I have to make a small uh, um, yeah, um, correction. I am not a doctor yet. I don't want to assume anything here. <laughs> I'm still studying for my PhD. Yeah, but other than that, um, yeah, I am going to, uh, or I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about what I do. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Great, yeah, uh, thank you. And sorry for that. And all the best with your uh, PhD. Uh, and Next, we have um, Dr. Anna Chobri. She is from our own Via Bremen family. So welcome, Anna. Great to see you again. And Anna actually has a background in experimental physics, and she is uh, currently working as a project manager with OHP in Germany. And um, Anna actually advises the Polish Space Agency on a lot of matters related to space strategy. So she has a really uh, diverse perspective, even on the policy front. And as, um, Anna is, the, is one of the candidates for the ESA astronaut program. So that's what makes her unique today. And so thank you so much for your time, Anna, and welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's really honor to be with so amazing panelists, but also it's the very first time for me um, that uh, I can also speak. <laughs> I am a panelist for BIA. Usually I was the one who was inviting some interesting panelists. So it's very new for me territory, and I'm very excited about it. Yeah, yeah, now you can sit back and relax, I guess, when, <laughs> and, and share your insights. So um, all of these people, all of these panelists we have today have really amazing uh, work. They've done really amazing work. So please check them out, uh, check out their profiles and their work online, uh, because I don't want to spend like two hours reading their bios, which are very, very long and very, very awesome. So let's jump into the discussion right away. And... Um, it's really amazing. Um, sorry. Yeah, it's really amazing that, you know, it's been 58 years since we had the first woman in space um, and only about 10% of them so far are women. Uh, so actually the statistic kind of baffles me because, you know, thinking from an engineer's perspective, women make uh, really efficient astronauts, right? Because they have smaller bodies, that is less mass for the same brain power. Uh, and they have lower metabolic rates, so they consume less food, less water, less oxygen, and they can, they are the ones right now who can make babies, you know, obvious choice for sp future space travel. But in the past, Alice, this, this, uh, my question is to you, in the past, uh, why didn't anyone even consider these factors and think women are perhaps really good candidates for space? And in future, do you think women astronauts would be more, more mainstream? It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because when we read early science fiction, it's all about the colonization of space. And how did they ever think that was going to happen if women weren't actually allowed to go? And there's a very strong uh, masculine competitive thread that runs through all of this. And, you know, based on the idea that male bodies are the standard of humanity, 
that uh, going into space requires uh, incredibly special um, mental and physical skills, which women don't have or didn't have. And when you look at particularly at the early US space program, although this was also fairly similar in the USSR, the idea was, uh, you know, the ideal um, space traveler's body was, was a, a, the, the classic thing of the right stuff. It was about courage and masculinity and risk. And both USSR and US space programs um, had in the 1960s had these difficulties, these big debates about who got to control the spacecraft because they were all coming from a test pilot background until Valentina. And an automated spacecraft was held to diminish the masculinity of the early astronauts and cosmonauts. So it was, it was about a demonstration of masculinity at that level. And of course, if women start doing things, and we've definitely seen this as women have moved into more diverse career paths, the more women are doing something, the less manly it is for the men who are doing it. And it, you know, we still see shades of this in discussions around uh, who should be going to space. And, and of course, it's, it's far more, um, a far more nuanced problem than just, just looking at standard uh, genders as well. Who gets to go to space um, is, is still premised on that sort of idealized masculine able body that you know manages to exclude a whole range of other people so we're you know we're still kind of trying to slough off the residues of the early space age where women had to really fight just to be considered physically and mentally uh fit to go to space but and i realize this is a long rave but um as you've already said, Roshana, like uh, women are on average tend to be smaller. They use energy more efficiently. They have dexterous um, fingers. Um, and this is something which came up uh, when there was an attempt to have um, year before last, uh, the first all female spacewalk. And of course, as we know, it didn't turn out because there weren't enough sort of medium sized spacesuits for two women to be out at once. But one of the NASA staff said, oh, well, look, you know, really you need to be tall to reach into these places. And thinking about things like manual dexterity, which belongs to a number of professions women were traditionally relegated to because these tasks were held to be menial and repetitive, actually becomes an advantage in the space environment where these are the kinds of tasks that often have to be done. So in the future, I am waiting for our first all female uh, space habitat or surface habitat, because I think we're going to learn a lot about the assumptions that, that all of these things have been based on up until this point. So that's what I think. Okay, that's, that's a fabulous perspective. Yeah, with more and more robotic missions and more and more less reliance on physical dexterity, hopefully our space uh, populations would be more diverse. And um, yeah, so uh, moving on, um, as we you know just discussed, space travel has historically been really biased uh, towards men. Um, so and this so this leads to this question. Uh, yeah, you know, in, in terms of the size of spacesuits and the design of toilets, perhaps. So uh, Anika, having done so many analog missions, so how is it in the analog missions? Do you also see this difference? Um, first of all, I ha have to add as well that I have not been on a really extended analog mission. Um, I've uh, spent a lot of time in training and um, over several days, but the first big mission I'm going to do is uh, this year in October in the Negev um, desert in Israel, um, just to clear that up. Mm -hmm. But anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, and yeah, I, me personally, I um, experienced this um, bias because when um, the class of 2019 that I am part of um, in the Austrian Space Forum was selected, there were about one third female applicants, um, but I am the only woman that was selected um, mm. with uh, seven men. 
Um, and of course, I was asking them afterwards um, how that is and why um, there were not more of the women selected in the end. And the spacesuit simulator that we work with is one of the main reasons for that. Um, because um, we work with a really complex machine um, and this uh, spacesuit simulator weighs up to 50 kilos. Um, it takes a lot of uh, time to put it on. And then you spend about four to six hours, uh, mainly in deserts or other extreme environments working in that suit. And you can imagine if you have a woman weighing about 50 kilos herself and then putting on that suit, um, that's like almost impossible. She would have to be really, really trained. And even for me, um, and I can say in this group of women that I weigh about uh, 68 kilos, <laughs> it's not a secret. Um, even for me, it's really um, difficult to work with that. And I have to train a lot. Um, and sometimes it's kind of annoying that um, the guys are like, oh, I didn't train that much and I'm training every other day and they are still running away from me. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think that um, this, um, yeah, let's say overcome tradition to design things from a male perspective um, really has to change. And that's not only true for space flight, it's true for all areas of life. And there's big discussions about if you have to have, for example, femtech, why not have a technology for all? Um, but on the other hand, if you like raise awareness for that topic uh, by applying the term femtech, for example, um, then you open up a discussion about this whole area. And then maybe in the future, we won't need a, such a big, um, yeah, thing or making such a big thing out of it. But I think that having, for example, the NASA standards um, that you like, you know, do you have standards? Uh, it's a whole pamphlet uh, saying how long your arm has to be or your how broad mm -hmm. your shoulders can be. I mean, it, on, uh, it also selects out male um, applicants, for example, that are too buff uh, and that won't fit into the suits as well. Um, and you do have to have a certain yeah, range, um, so you can, um, yeah, produce things uh, cheaper or that you have to take into account designing, for example, the space craft, um, so you can't really have a one size fits all, but you can't um, have a really individual thing either, so you have to find something in between. Um, but I don't know why it should not be possible, for example, to have spacesuits that, um, fit women and another set that fits men and uh, something in between that a, a small men or big women can can wear stuff like that uh, there's no like financial or uh, engineering or whatever reason not to do it it's just yeah i don't know overcome tradition <laughs> mm. yeah so that's my my take on that yeah, that's also one interesting point you made. Uh, maybe when we have uh, space travel happening at large scale on, you know, when it scales up, hopefully we'll have these medium, large and excess and Excel, you know, all these sizes, hopefully. So which brings me to the next question. Um, so currently space travel is primarily astronaut programs by space agencies, right? Uh, so Anna, uh, having worked, you know, with space agencies and also in the industry, space industry. So do you think there's going to be um, impending budget cuts, especially for space flight? Because now, because of COVID, the entire world is, uh, you know, uh, on a major economic recovery. So firstly, do you think there's going to be budget cuts for this space, uh, space flight programs? And secondly... Uh, we have a lot of commercial activity uh, in terms of space flight. So we have Axiom, who's building a commercial uh, space station and, you know, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic offering these. And uh, so do you see publicly funded astronaut programs or commercial activity happening more in human space flight in the future? Oh, yes, definitely. I, my impression is, and what I also observe in general, is that we took a pause, definitely. We took a pause in every single aspect of our life now. Uh, but but it doesn't mean that we stopped. Uh, at some point, uh, it is not really first time that we had to take a pause like this. A few years ago, for example, there was also like so, sort of economic crisis. But also there was, uh, let's say, reduction in terms of opportunities. Companies were also reducing their budget and so on. Um, then was also September 11 that, uh, for example, we all have to understand how we can travel. Uh, so these changes already happen in our life that we had to take a break and uh, reconsider certain things, but it doesn't mean that we stopped. Um, 
my understanding and uh, my wish and my dream as well is that and aspirations that, that human beings still want to explore, still want to discover, still want to do more, still want to do more exciting things. And I think that uh, we know Earth quite well. Um, my passion also are oceans, protection of oceans. Is, uh, we don't know them at all, let's say. I think this is another interesting thing that we are also following. We are learning more and more about the role of oceans. But we also are developing more and more to be space creatures. So I think um, what really happened, I, and I'm very excited what really happened, that are these private, private sectors really coming and disrupting because in my opinion, it really gives a chance for everybody uh, to participate. Uh, it allows uh, really diversity and inclusiveness much more uh, than really uh, the fixed programs that are purely um, institutional. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, disruption. I hope is always good. <laughs> that's nice. So, um, I mean, speaking of, you know, disruption, private companies coming in and all that. Uh, so going to space right now is either individuals or, you know, very small crews in the ISS or suborbital flights. So um, how do you think space travel uh, would evolve? So Alice, uh, maybe you can answer this. How do you think space travel would evolve towards having larger crews and eventually communities? Because that's the end goal, right? Having like a thriving, sustainable, large communities. Uh, living in Martian bases or, I don't know, orbital bases. So how do you think we'll make this transition from small crews to larger communities? That's a really interesting question because, you know, at the moment we're seeing space station design move towards smaller crews and smaller spaces. So how do you move from that suddenly to the lunar surface and 20 people or 100 people on Mars, um, which, which I do think is, is um, perhaps unrealistic in the next 50 to 100 years. There, there's a lot of people working on different aspects of how you would live in another planetary environment or another orbital environment. And a lot of that uh, work is focused around social aspects, particularly, you know, how people are going to get on with each other and not end up sort of creating a, 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 a violent society, should we say, when, where, because there is literally no, nowhere to go, nowhere to escape, nowhere to get away from things. Uh, if you're on Mars, you're not going to be able to get home. So designing habitats for this kind of social environment, I think, is really challenging and my perspective on what I see happening at the moment is well first of all we're, we're lacking even some of the most basic technology to have these kinds of communities as far as I know and I'm happy to be corrected about this we have never successfully made an enclosed biosphere which has been able to sustain uh, you know vegetable production so that seems to me to be a pretty big gap in all of the you know, aspirations for having more permanent um, uh, settlements or habitats on the moon and Mars. And we have examples of isolated research stations like the Antarctica to, to look for in terms of uh, parallels with social situations. And there's a story, I kind of find it amusing, although it's not really amusing. Um, uh, some years back uh, on one of the Antarctic research stations, there was a, a bloke who kept um, giving away the endings of the novels that his colleague was reading. And his colleague was so incensed by this, he ended up stabbing him. And obviously that's not great. Nobody thought that was great. But you kind of like have sympathy, don't you? You just think if you're stuck with someone and they keep spoiling everything you're reading, like that's that's the social problem for sure. So I think um, when I look at a lot of the studies of the psychological factors which uh, help people live together, I'm I'm often struck by how sort of thin they are uh, and how they're often 
focused on a, a narrow number of factors without sort of taking the full complexity of human social life into account. And I think that's scaling up from the space habitats we already know about and the analog environments that we have. I, I think there's so many missing pieces of the sequence and there's so many missing, so many missing pieces of the technology and of, I mean, in some ways, we, we're not going to be able to predict how people will react and how their feelings and social life will sort of evolve over time because nobody has ever done it. There might be aspects of people's reactions to things that we haven't even foreseen because analogs can only go so far. So I, I think there's, you know, you can only plan for so much you can only predict so much and I don't know how we're going to get there and I don't know what it's going to be like when we get there I think we're going to just going to have to find out interesting um Alice I just saw your message on the chat uh that you were working on designing these more women and other friendly space habitats so would you like to share a few details about that well, very quickly, um, my major research project at the moment is the International Space Station Archaeological Project, which I'm doing with Justin Walsh at Chapman University. And we're thinking about habitability and uh, adaptation uh, sort of from an archaeological perspective. And as, as Annika said before, there's so much about space design that is, is based around the assumption that that sort of women and diverse bodies aren't going to be there. So I'm kind of trying to just deconstruct all of these ideas and, and kind of imagine from the ground up, like what it would be like if we were designing uh, not for uh, a default male body, but for um, other kinds of bodies and the kinds of things we might need. So, but I haven't got far enough into it yet to have um, anything kind of definitive to tell you about. Yeah, but it's really interesting to know that uh, there's efforts being done and put in this direction. So it's, it's fascinating. And taking up on, um, you know, um, the male body. So Anika, uh, you know, most data till so far on the effects of space and living in space uh, is uh, available on white men, not just any man, but, you know, white men. So how long do you think it would take for us to gather enough data uh, to even consider establishing these diverse human settlements or, you know, bigger, larger crews in space? Do you think it's going to take, I don't know, how X number of analog missions or X number of space uh, flights to ISS or, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I'm sure I can't give you like an exact number or even an average or anything, yeah. but um, I was nodding along all the time to what Alice said. I was like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because um, I think that kind of sums everything up. Uh, both questions refer to some of the same things. Um, first of all, I think that the psychological part is, is so, so, so important. And you can tell from all the analog studies that are done or have been done. And also, as you said, um, Antarctica or um, polar missions, um, um, sailing missions, uh, even from prisons or other um, yeah, military um, facilities where people are like in closed spaces for longer periods of time. Um, there is some data, but you always have small groups and um, to yeah, filter out the psychological effects and how to find good teams that work together on long-term missions. Um, there's so much research that is still missing in that area that um, I think it will take quite some time and a lot of trial and error um, to get it right. Um, and I think that women play such an important role in that because um, of course you don't want to have all male or all female teams. I think that a mix is always best because um, it's not about who's best or better or whatever. It's about having a lot of diverse people bringing all their strengths and combining it because we are always better if we work together. Um, and as you said in the beginning, like women might have more dexterity or um, fine motoric skills and um, a big male might be able to reach the upper shelf, whatever, you know what I mean? But um, <laughs> it only works if everybody brings their best, yeah. And um, how to scale that up to big um, communities 
um, is so far in the future that I think the first step is to get it right with small crews um, to make it possible to reach those goals further away. And regarding um, habitat design or um, yeah, all engineering, the, the whole engineering side of things, um, that's quite interesting because um, since I haven't lived in a habitat for a longer period of time, I'm not able to say something in advance, but now like thinking about it, I'm definitely going to yeah, take a close look and see how it feels. Um, I'm going to be the only woman in Israel. There's uh, five men and me, and we have close living quarters. We have uh, two bathrooms. Um, so it's going to be interesting. We have um, one um, experiment where we wear Bluetooth trackers um, to observe our movement, our team um, development. If somebody spends a lot of time by themselves or if uh, there are certain interactions going on, stuff like that. Um, and I think that all the analogs going on at the moment are really important. And I'm really excited to see that a lot of groups are springing up all over the world doing really interesting research. And that's not only like the big ones that have really sophisticated uh, projects, but also small ones, student groups, whatever, because all of those add to our data. And um, of course, some look at nutrition, others look at group dynamics. The, we are more looking towards um, like uh, workflows, processes, interaction between technology and humans, um, stuff like that. Um, we have this exploration cascade where we look for which steps to take if you land on Mars and want to look for traces of life, um, how to not uh, contaminate uh, your area, but also how not to contaminate your habitat, stuff like that. Um, yeah, but we do need a lot of analogs, uh, which are cheaper and can be quick and make mistakes and learn from those. But we also need a lot of um, yeah, interaction between those groups, a lot of discussions and um, sharing of data and of knowledge um, to be able to, to develop really quick. And I think that with all the analogs going on with the private sector being interested and putting money in all of this. Um, the dynamic is so, um, yeah, taking or picking up speed that I wouldn't dare to make like, uh, uh, or say a number, but I think it can be faster than we think or that we hope for, um, depending on so many factors that it's hard to judge, but maybe a few years from now, um, we are way farther than we, my thinking now. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's very optimistic. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's very hopeful. Uh, it's a very hopeful picture. So um, I'm glad. And uh, okay, I, I think we've been talking too long about these uh, large scale settlements and everything, which probably will take a very long time. So coming a little um, closer to the present. So I always wonder this, right? So we see a lot of these uh, human rated rockets. Uh, and for now, they are mostly, um, you know, intended for orbital space or uh, suborbital flights or space flight. Uh, but as Elon Musk famously said, these can also be used as, you know, point to point uh, transportation on Earth. So basically New York to Beijing, like two, year, two hours. So that can be like super cool. Uh, so um, Anna, maybe you can comment on this because, you know, you're uh, in the industry with OHP. And do you think in, I don't know, the next 20, 30 years or any time frame, do you think uh, we would be doing this, like using these human rated rockets for point to point transport? You know, do you, in terms of volume and revenues? Uh, okay, I, I cannot really speak about from the business point of view because the business is really changing. I also come from the telecommunication um, domain where many years ago, the business was very huge, uh, geostationary satellites. And now uh, the, the orders are dropping. So we are remodeling the, the whole telecommunication uh, business. We are considering more constellations of small um, uh, satellites, uh, concentrating not only on a business, let's say to business model, delivering some sort of signal or some sort of service, but also concentrating really on the customer. Can we have the internet in our mobile, walking somewhere in the desert from the satellite, for example? So this is really changing. Uh, so what I'm really hoping and thinking in few years, 
And this is not only related to some sort of transportation, but we will not, we will be space creatures. So we will be developing our services, our products, not only for Earth, but also from sp for space. So there will be really synergy. We will not be only thinking I'm developing something from Earth and let's think how to use it for space or vice versa. I have something uh, very interesting that has been developed for space. Let's make a spin-off for Earth. I think we will be thinking really in one product, one service that could be working there and there. So. Yes, uh, I think this will be possible and this will be the way, uh, because otherwise it takes a lot of time to make this spin up, to make this transformation, to make these changes, a lot of time, money and so on, that sometimes is really developing a wheel. Um, yeah, so this is really my hope uh, and this is what I'm also aiming for, <laughs> not being earth, space and so on. Oh, cool. So you think there's going to be a really thriving space economy, you know, and it's... Uh... Yes, definitely. Uh, which, which, what kind of products do you think would be the first uh, to be made in space or to be made for space? Oh my God. <laughs> I think uh, this transportation is one thing. This is something that we are really seeing um, that, um, that we want to travel, that we want to move and uh, we will not stop it. Obviously, we are very concerned about very different aspects like uh, environmental aspects. Um, that's why uh, I'm very supporting now some sort of uh, green uh, pro propulsion systems or green solutions of the transportation. Um, obviously, uh, electric cars is one way, but we have a lot of way to go on the run, develop uh, sustainable uh, technologies. Um, but we cannot stop it. Uh, so that's why, and the world is coming faster and faster. So in the in the past, let's say even ten years ago, it was really okay to travel a certain amount of time and spend this uh, amount of time. But now people don't want it anymore, and so uh, we have we have to be able to come up with solutions that will really be uh, interesting for these people. Um, we are living. And this is what we are really experiencing, that we are really living in a global village. So that means we want to be connected. And this also means that as much as possible, we can do what we are doing now via webinars and so on. But this human contact is also very important, uh, but we don't want to waste obviously our time sitting somewhere in the vehicle. Yeah, yeah, mm. definitely. Anna. So yeah, I think uh, maybe we should, uh, we've spoken enough about the future, near future, maybe we can, time to come back to the present. And one thing that's interesting and exciting is Anna is preparing for, uh, to be, um, she's applying for the astronaut, the ESA astronaut candidate. So Anna, can you tell us a little bit about how your preparation is going and, you know, at what stage you are right now? Okay, so first of all, I want to say that I come from Poland. Uh, I guess you are guessing it from my uh, accent. And this is really the very first time opportunity for Polish people that we can participate in a call like this. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, there was a one person sent to space as a cosmonaut. Uh, he was a pilot, military pilot, so <laughs> uh, very typical from the past um, astronaut. And ever since there was really no opportunity at all for Polish people uh, to participate. Uh, in the call. So finally, I'm very, very glad uh, that we can do it. So when I learned about it, uh, I was very, very excited and I said, yes, I have to do it. This was really my dream uh, to uh, fly to the space, um, to work for uh, all the humans, because this is like a mission, in my opinion. It's not, it's not only my personal dream, but this is also a mission. So um, I basically read very quickly the requirements <laughs> and I started to prepare for them. So one of them uh, was, uh, for example, the medical test. It turned out that there are so many people who would like to do it <laughs> that uh, our doctors here in around were really, really booked. <laughs> and so I had to a little bit fight uh, to get my appointments <laughs> and to follow them, but uh, everything is uh, okay. So uh, obviously uh, I also participate in very various uh, webinars. Um, I think on one side, uh, pandemic a little bit uh, slowed down different preparations for me and for other candidates because we had to stay in con confinement. We couldn't do certain things, certain trainings. But on the other hand, now we are so much used to participating in various webinars and there's uh, a lot of uh, 
online conversations between candidates or astronauts or people who support all their recruitments that you can get a lot of uh, recruiting uh, tips. So I was really following a lot of webinars. One of them is by uh, Claudia Kessler. She prepared a uh, very interesting uh, presentation, introduction about the, the whole process and certain steps. So she recommended some book. Uh, how to be, um, how to prepare to be astronaut. I bought it immediately. I was reading it. I was preparing it. Uh, she made a very good point that uh, it's not really um, like this, that you just apply and then wait and uh, hopefully you will be selected and then you participate in tests. You have to prepare already for the test, uh, various things for the test, physically, mentally and so on. So I was uh, doing it as much as possible uh, with all these uh, restrictions that we have right now. Um, yeah, and then I was really working strong on my CV, on my uh, uh, letter, obviously working with the native speaker um, to control it. And it was also a very, very nice treat for me personally, like in the past for my accomplishments, for my dreams, aspirations. I was reflecting a lot on my uh, developments, on my achievements. So yeah, this was really great. And meeting also a lot of people. This is so fantastic. I met so many people who are interested to be also astronaut. And we have this fantastic connection where we can uh, share our experiences. Um, our dreams. So I developed a really fantastic community and uh, I really hope all the best for all of them, although they are my competitors. <laughs> but this is really fantastic uh, to meet uh, people who have certain aspirations and dreams like me and they have this fantastic energy. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, very nice to know and all the best, Anna. Um, Anika, so um, how, how does your training go? How does the training for an ast analog astronaut go? Uh, maybe can you compare with the training for a real astronaut? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, I want to say, Anna, um, that I applied as well. So I hope <laughs> that we will see each other uh, for the selection. We will see. And <laughs> that I, I totally get what you say, that um, that's like this whole thing in the space sector that you connect to people and you meet so many different people. That's really one of the biggest pluses for me that I experienced also in the Austrian Space Forum as an analog astronaut. And um, I think that from having had this selection, um, I can transfer most of that to the ESA selection that, of course, you have to have like the background, the academic um, achievements, and um, you have to be physically fit, stuff like that. But that is what like all the applicants uh, that get to a certain point bring this, right? So when I went to the selection to be an analog astronaut, um, I met this group of people, all of them had PhDs and were scuba divers, whatever, skydivers. I was like, oh my God, why did they invite me? <laughs> but um, yeah, then I, I really realized that being an astronaut also means that um, you have to be a certain kind of person and that you have to bring some character characteristics that, um, yeah, obviously feel natural to me because that's how I am, but that are not that common, for example, to to be able to lead people, but also be able to let yourself be led and to change this um, according to situation, for example, that you have to be resistant to stress, that you like work under pressure really well, that you organize yourself, self, stuff like that. But you also um, keep calm if you are bored, if you don't have anything to do for long periods of time, stuff like that, where you have to be like really between both poles that are really extremes, you have to be able to be everything. And for me, in the in the past, I felt a lot of times I felt like I'm not I'm good at a lot of things, but I'm not good at anything special. But exactly that was something that made me um, able to be selected as an analog astronaut. And I imagine that for ESA, it's kind of the same. And regarding to the question for training, a lot of the training um, kind of tries to in, in enhance those um, skills and abilities. We have a lot of team training um, where we do exercises to uh, find our roles um, because there's not one person selected, there's always a team selected. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of training where you learn the technology. In my case, we have to be able to work with the spacesuit simulator. Um, we have everything from quad bike training, first aid, firefighter training. We had lectures in planetology, orbital mechanics, night sky orientation. We had a lot of uh, geology training. 
Um, I went on expeditions with universities and uh, we had uh, training in the Alps and stuff like that um, because in Israel or for our missions, geology plays a big role. Um, but then there's, um, like me, I am a microbiologist and engineer, but there's also physicians and physicists and um, other engineers, um, even lawyers um, and uh, other, uh, they have other science degrees. Um, so even though all of us are spe specialists on some topics, um, all of us have to be able to do everything. So for the missions, we have specific training where you train all the experiments. So everyone is able to do everything. Um, so there's like this difference between training in general and then mission spe uh, specific training. Um, yeah, so it's a really broad training that aims at um, making you skilled and autonomous. Um, that's another thing that for Mars missions, you have to be way more autonomous than, for example, for going to the ISS. Because if there's a problem on the ISS, then you call Houston and they tell you from their manual what, you, what buttons to press. <laughs> but if you go to Mars and there's a red light blinking and it takes about 20 minutes at least for your answer to get back to you. Um, and the answer is uh, the red light means your air is gone in three minutes, then yeah, you have a problem. So yeah. Sorry, long answer, but that's... <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So Alice, oh, yeah, please go on. Please go ahead. I just raised my hand because as I was listening to Anna and Annika talk, I was thinking about my own experience, which is, you know, as not as an analog astronaut or an astronaut candidate, but as an archaeologist, I've spent a lot of time in the field with small groups of people, um, you know, in situations where camping, totally not my favourite, but, you know, where you um, have very minimal hygiene conditions and terrible food and things like that. And um, one of the primary um, uh, characteristics of a good team member in those situations and and like people particularly because I was working in the private sector as a heritage consultant um, so people who don't work out kind of get weeded out fairly quickly I think and I realize that's open to 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 you know some misuse but the the characteristic that was the most valued was you know not necessarily being the fastest digger or the one who could survey the greatest area in one day it was being the person who saw that something needed to be done and did it without being asked and and many people who became very successful and very trusted colleagues weren't especially good at any one thing but you could absolutely rely on them as team members and um, I think that would be pretty similar in the situations that um, Anna and Annika um, hopefully will end up in. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, actually even as uh, Australia, I see has uh, a Mars uh, analog station, I guess, right, Alice? Oh, we do, yes. So in fact, there might be, uh, so there's one at Arcarola, which is in, uh, uh, in the Flinders Ranges area of South Australia. Um, and the Mars Society of South Australia has used that as an analog station for a while. But I think there's another one somewhere. It might be in the Pilbara. So yeah. yes, if, if Anna and Annika want to come for a, a visit and come out into the field with me, I can do the archeology span bit, you can do the Stacey bit. Um, that would be amazing. Please count me in, I also would love to come. <laughs> you all come, admin. everybody can <laughs> come. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a long queue. <laughs> Uh, actually, um, so we, uh, Berlin and Bre uh, the Bremen and Berlin uh, Women in Space local group, so we have a little book club and uh, our latest read is this. It's called Stars, uh, Starship Citizen by Don Marston. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about this. So in this book, the author examines how uh, indigenous principles around resource management, philosophy, you know, ethics and all this can help in ensuring the physical and mental well-being of uh, um, uh, humans on space voyages, right? So as someone who's worked on uh, a lot of indigenous societies and indigenous culture, Alice, do you, um, I don't know, can you, ha have you seen, have you found any principles that can be uh, scaled like this um, way? 
Yeah, I guess. So, so there's a, a, a number of them. I mean, one is uh, a really important sort of principle in Indigenous land management in Australia, which, which is about rights and responsibilities and is, is a sort of a form of governance, I guess, that is, is not based on sovereignty, it's not based on hierarchy, it's sort of based on a social distribution of responsibility, um, which people take absolutely seriously, and which le you know, leads to sort of good environmental outcomes, I guess. Um, and, the, and also there's social structures which are, you know, extremely different to um, the kinds that, that many people are used to in Western industrial countries, particularly. Um, again, we have networks of um, obligations between people um, that kind of lead to people um, being responsible and doing the right thing. Um, and it's kind of hard to describe some of this stuff a bit more simply than that. But, uh, you know, like Indigenous social structures and governance structures in Australia um, are, are fairly similar to um, a whole range of them across the world and uh, also reflect um, sort of earlier uh, European ones which kind of got phased out under feudalism and um, industrialization and capitalism. So they're actually, they're very common across uh, the world and it wouldn't take too much to kind of um, revive. I mean, we see, we see kind of the shadows of them in, in contemporary life. So they're kind of just under the surface. So I think there, there are, um, you know, it's very, easy to just say, oh, we'll just adopt these methods of operation that come from indigenous societies. I mean, it's not as simple as that, but I think we definitely, we need more diversity in space and we're ignoring a whole range of um, diverse ways of operating in the world. So I think it, we should be drawing lessons um, from some of these other places. Okay, that's uh, interesting. Uh, actually, I'd like to come back to this analog uh, missions, the analog sites we were talking about, right? Because, uh, Anna, I think there is also um, one analog mission site in uh, Poland. And I think it's also open to internationals. I'm not sure, maybe you can correct me on this. Because unlike the, so for instance, the Austrian Space Forum, uh, the analog missions, I guess, are not, they're only... Uh, uh, limited to Europeans because of, uh, I guess, health insurance, some legal, uh, I guess, aspects. So, um, but yeah, but I think, uh, I'm not sure if the Polish one is open to internationals or maybe you can talk a little bit about that site. Yes, uh, so Poland is not known to be like a space giant, like Germany, for example, or France, as I, as I was growing up. Uh, I obviously was dreaming perhaps to work in the aerospace industry or do something in this uh, domain and I didn't have opportunity to study. There were no aerospace uh, studies available. Uh, obviously later there were no aerospace companies or institutes, uh, very strong institutes where I could uh, easily start to work. But this is really funny, we developed very strong analog uh, opportunities, analog astronaut opportunities. Actually there are two places in Poland, two wow. habitats, very well established uh, habitats uh, with a lot of experience already, two teams with a lot of experience, uh, where in the end, regularly, really regularly, and despite the uh, pandemic and so on, are organized missions. And as far as I understood, basically everybody can participate. So, it, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there is, um, sort of recruiting process, uh, because uh, obviously there are certain things that have to be considered. Um, perhaps some sort of mental uh, health or some sort of physical health as well. Uh, but in the end, yes, uh, this is really so fantastic that in my country, basically everybody can become astronaut uh, for certain uh, time. And obviously because uh, all the facilities are in Poland, the prices are corresponding to the Polish economy, so it's really, really cheap uh, compared, to, as far as I understood, so, so, for example, to Hawaii, analog uh, mission participation. Uh, yes, uh, so one of them is run, one of them is run by my friend. Uh, she's uh, astrobiologist, 
and uh, this is really great. I'm very proud of this, that uh, the woman actually is the brain <laughs> behind it, the core uh, team uh, behind it. She prepares the missions, uh, she uh, selects uh, the candidates and so on. Uh, so yes, I really would recommend really checking it uh, because uh, yeah, it's, mm. it's really exciting. And, and they always also take care of it, that there is a diversity diversity and inclusion in terms of candidates. Uh, so I'm, I'm very glad to see that there are very different people coming from all over the world, um, that it's popular, that it's well established uh, and yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Now maybe you could write the, especially the Lunaris um, contact details in the chat if somebody's interested. Uh, I am I'm using now another computer that I'm using normally. So oh, I okay, I see. Uh, and, um, at the moment, uh, this data, but um, I can check it out and write it in the chat. No problem. So I, I can uh, yes, I can take my time. Uh, it will not be immediate uh, reply, but uh, I can uh, check and let you know. Okay. That would be so interesting. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, this is cool. Especially, I mean, I absolutely love these programs with. Uh, quite open, you know, to the internationals, because um, like you said, most of the space activity is usually in the US, uh, Europe, or now Australia. So, but yeah, this is quite cool. I also keep fantasizing about one day where there might be an analog, uh, because in India, so I come from India, and India has like a huge, uh, you know, desert, also <laughs> in the northwest part of it. So I always think, oh, that's a wonderful place to, you know, to let the sandy, the white sandy beaches, or sorry, not beaches, but just sand. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, oh, wow. Thanks, uh, Anika. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the link. Oh. Oh, one is Lunaris and another is Astronaut Training Center. And this is the website and this is the person that I mentioned to. Um, so. This one is set up by uh, United Nations, is it? Um, Anna, so um, no, this is the perhaps they are co collaborating on it definitely. Uh, they are collaborating with well-established international partners, but this is the private, uh, let's say, entity. Private, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we have a few, yeah. So does anyone want to ask the panelists or anyone any questions? Hi, Maria. She was having a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Sabrina, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. just uh, from Anna Maria. So she, um, she was, she's interested to know is the fact that um, we are going to equality is pushing female uh, applicants to behave or to look yeah, be even more as as a as a male, or I, I think if I understood good what what you wrote, Anna Maria, or are you just uh, uh, sure. if you want, uh, I can yeah. specify yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really appreciated the, all of the discussion and uh, what you aligned to the during the webinar uh, about the uh, the difference between uh, the female and the masculine approach uh, that is uh, very important in order to take into account. Uh, for a, a different point of view and uh, for the exigency, also for habitat and uh, a, a lot of things, but also as approach that is very, very important. And uh, sometimes I've seen that also uh, in case of women, uh, they adopt uh, a masculine uh, uh, approach uh, for in order to guarantee their career. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, this is a, a good approach for women to progress uh, on and uh, to adequate uh, instead uh, to, to change and uh, to highlight on the importance of difference and on diversity that each of us have uh, to be recognized. So this is my, my question in order to, to have your point of view about it. Maybe. Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Annika, please go ahead. Yes. I'm trying to make it quick. Uh, if I understood you correctly, um, you're asking if uh, females 
or that females should not um, take the male qualities and make them their own to be equal, but they should bring their own uh, qualities, right? Did I get that? Yeah, okay. Um, you know that I, um, I get this question a lot, how it feels like to be the only woman on a team and um, how I manage with my family because I also have three daughters. Um, they are between uh, seven and 13 years old. So yeah, that's um, a topic always, even though I don't really feel as a person that it made such a big difference in my life. Um, but my answer is uh, that I kind of, uh, yeah, compiled over the time that uh, being a woman and being a mother um, really made me able or um, gave me the qualities uh, that I bring into the team. And for example, being really stress resistant and being able to organize myself, um, to have good time management, um, to keep calm, to uh, see what others need. As you said before, like um, in a team that you see what is needed and that you just do it without looking for yourself too much and stuff like that. All those are things that I learned from being in a family. Um, and yeah, so it's important that everybody knows themselves and their strengths, no matter if they are women or men. Um, and yeah, to uh, highlight your strengths and to know what yourself, uh, what who you are and what you bring to a team and to be self-confident about it. Um, and I think if women can manage that, um, they don't need to compare themselves uh, to the male side. They can just be themselves. Many thanks. I also would like to add something. Uh, as uh, Anika said, uh, she definitely um, is so successful because she is a woman, she is mother and so on. And we have to remember that we are not only our gender. When we are, even if I'm coming to the meeting and I'm the only woman, let's say, sitting on the table, I'm not only woman there. I, I have uh, many other features that are absolutely very important and that make me unique and they allow me to um, make certain achievements in certain way. I, I also, for example, come from a village. Uh, so this is very uh, unusual in the SOTEC industry where most of the people are coming from cities where their families and their parents were studying as well and working in industry. So this is another aspect that also uh, differentiates me from other people. I have PhD, so that means I have experience from academia and industry. So that also gives me different perspective. I come from countries, uh, Poland, the country that is not really a space giant. So it also shows me um, different uh, perspective. And I'm frequently the youngest. <laughs> and uh, I'm frequently the person who is the only one coming, for example, from certain circle or certain family, that I'm the only woman who moved abroad, the only one who studied, the only one who works in industry and, for example, earn my own uh, living. So I think we have to remember this, that we are so complex and we bring much more. And uh, we also need to remember that we are working and living in groups, uh, in teams, and we want to achieve, uh, and we, to be able to achieve something, we need other people and other teams. And obviously um, there are certain statistics that we cannot forget. One person will not change the world in the end. So we always need to find different allies that will support us. If this is a woman, if this is a man and so on. And to really make any change um, and so on, we need like more or less 30% of people who different differently. Then their voices will be heard, then there will be action taken. So um, in the end, what I advise, like uh, one person should, be, should uh, fit to the team, in my opinion, uh, because one person really with certain mindset will not really change much. Um, if this is a woman, if this is a man, if this is an older person, if this is a person with certain uh, idea and so on. So I would uh, advise really to look uh, for different people who will be like us uh, in certain levels and uh, work with them to make certain changes. Yeah, yeah. Many, many thanks, a very good message that is on the importance of the team. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, you uh, actually, Alice and uh, Sabrina, you guys have been having a very interesting conversation on the chat. Maybe, 
you can share it with us here. I want to hear from Sabrina about this um, space travel amusement park. Um, yeah, that was uh, the idea. We have this uh, space startup weekend in Bremen. So I suggest, because I would like to be an astronaut or, or the idea of being an astronaut is so exciting. And I thought, why cannot organize something to do that here as um, escape room like? So they can do that, we can do space travel. And actually we end up that we can create uh, uh, with the, this kind of uh, virtual reality machines that you have also in Disneyland, you can really have the, the experience of uh, be um, launched with a rocket because you can use a kind of a lift look like in one of these old rockets that they have uh, in Bremen that they, uh, and they have so many stuff that are not using anymore in Airbus, for example, that you can buy for not so expensive price and you can put a lift in it and putting 3D glasses and, and give a little bit of a shake and then you arrive in an escape room. So we, we're trying to create something like that and I thought it would be amazing because you can maybe also put on a suite with weights and so like simulating also gravity a, mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, but then uh, yeah, we run numbers and we end up, okay, there is, there are many people that would like to be astronauts, but they are not enough uh, to sustain a business <laughs> like that. But it was an idea that was really like running in my mind for a couple of months uh, on one end. And it was kind of amazing just to think about it. How can we do really, do it, really it realistic. Just, it should make business sense, right? Because we have these flight simulators and they don't, so as, which, as a, which they're not scalable. Profit. So we, we really run all the numbers and uh, there is no way you can uh, you can sustain a business out of it unless you don't get oh, some oh. kind of other money for it. <sighs> Anna, Anna, you please go ahead, Anna. Yeah. Yes, uh, I also participated in the startup uh, weekend. <laughs> we also had the, the same uh, problem, let's say, that we started with certain area and then we started to crash the numbers and then we said like, oops, <laughs> not really. So we also had to change and develop totally new uh, thing. So it was also very exciting. But uh, before I think uh, Sabrina came with her idea or anyone else, there was already an attempt in Bremen to build some sort of space, uh, fair amusement, uh, facility and in the end uh, it didn't make it through so it has been shut down because it was not uh, let's say uh, profitable enough. Uh, that was the problem this. because there was this bad experience but that was an amusement park in the real sense of amusement park so yeah. with a space uh, uh, background. That, that was Yes, it was also from one side so much exciting because we are living in Bremen space city. So there are so many companies here, so many institutes, so many historical projects and programs have been created here and developed and are still ongoing. Uh, Orion, for example, uh, module for Orion, for example, or Galileo and so on. So obviously, um, it was so natural to bring it to public, yes, to make more outreach, like to make it more accessible to people to reach. And still, uh, it has not been, uh, yes, uh, achieved, not possible. And it's a little bit pity. That's why I'm like also organizing, for example, events like Yuri's Night, where we can uh, we go to the public uh, with our space topics, with our space experts, and present different projects, different technologies or applications of space for Earth to people, to present it to people so that they can also have a little bit space world experience <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as much as a space a brainstorming on a space themed amusement park is very very tempting, I would love to go on and on about this. Maybe some other time with you guys, hopefully Bremen when we are at the Space Tech Expo, hopefully. Uh, Alice, we can also make it this time. But yeah, it's, I think it's been uh, more than an hour and um, Alice, it's also quite late in the evening for you. And I have to confess, I did have to get up quite early. So <laughs> it's not that late, but I am starting to get a little sleepy. Yeah, yeah so, so maybe I think uh, we can... Uh, we can have some closing uh, remarks with uh, with any of you panelists or any of the anybody here uh, on the session. Would you guys like to say anything, or share anything, or ask anything? Um. 
Well, could I come back to Valentina Tereshkova? Yes, please. Oh, um, I also want that. <laughs> because I just think, I don't know. I think how incredible that must have been. And she was under so much pressure. So the space historian Asif Siddiqui has, has analyzed a lot of the documents and the transcripts and stuff from Valentina's flight. And she was judged by a different standard to her male counterparts. And even now, I don't know if anybody's experienced this, but when I tweet about her, I often get uh, particularly Russian men coming out of the closet to say she was terrible and she failed. And she set um, uh, space flight for women back by, you know, 20 years. And it, I find it extraordinary that there are, there's such a culture of trying to discredit her that's alive in the former Soviet Union. Um, and I think that is such a demonstration. Has anyone else come across this? I get all these trolls come out when I tweet about her to, to lecture me about how she's a terrible person and how she failed. And, and, and I find this such an interesting narrative. She didn't fail. She orbited the earth. She, she got past, she was the one chosen to, out of all of the other candidates to go into space and be that standard bearer for uh, the rest of the women of the world. And there's an amazing um, oral history program, which has looked at how Russian women felt when she went into space. And they've, they, they felt so empowered and excited and all of those things. So, so I guess I just want to say thank you, Valentina Tereshkova, Dr. Valentina Tereshkova, actually, to be accurate, for having been that person who, who represents our hearts today in 2021. Um, by failed, do you think, uh, do you mean the communication equipment failure that she has experienced or her inability? No, I mean, she as an astronaut was a failure. Oh my God. That's what they mean. That's what they talk about. So there's this incredibly strong anti-Valentina current that exists. So yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's unthinkable. I mean, nobody's doing that to Yuri, are they? Yeah. Or any of those other. So she so they judged her by different standards. And then they said she represented all women, so women couldn't go back. And something that happened to her was there was a mistake in the programming of her Vostok, mm. and it was not programmed to descend. Wow. So she was gonna keep she was gonna keep going and she had to fix that. And that's and she only revealed that um not so very long ago. So there's all these people saying, you know, she, she was not a good cosmonaut when she had to deal with things that her male counterparts didn't deal with and that she never got credit for. So, yes, go well, Valentina. Yeah, I, oh, my God, Anna Maria says she knows Valentina. She's oh, no, she's going to meet her. her. Oh, congratulations. Oh, oh. Greet, her, greet her from us, from Anna and Annika. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm like, about, I'm thinking, you know, like, um, there was no Polish woman in space, uh, so yes, so for me, meeting them. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have this opportunity because I invited uh, during the symposium with uh, very important women uh, with uh, uh, import, historical uh, importance uh, together with uh, Valentina Tereskova and uh, Amelia Finzi that uh, you, I think you already know, is the uh, first Italian aerospace engineer and other uh, women uh, in the scientific field. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to personally know these uh, fantastic women. That's amazing, Anna Maria. Please convey lots of love and regards from all of us to... Uh, yes, yes of course. <laughs> And, and uh, from what Alice said, I think there's all the more reason to celebrate on a much grander scale, uh, Valentina's Day every year. So we will go strong. Yes, <laughs> I will yes. report it to her. <laughs> um, Anika, yeah, Anika, please go ahead. 
like to uh, add something as a closing from my side as well, that uh, we talk a lot, a lot about the first woman this, the first woman that, and I think that is really, really important. But also I read something from a German uh, com comedian, a female comedian today on Instagram. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, lost you. That's a big cliffhanger. Okay. Wow. Yeah, there I was, uh, I was gone <laughs> for a second. Um, yeah, I said that I read something from a German uh, female comedian. She that said that she felt a lot of pressure in her career um, because she always felt like there's only room for one woman in like the, the first whatever mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important, even though, for example, in the ESA selection, there might be only room for one or two women as well uh, this time. Um, but that uh, what Anna said, that there's such a community developing around the selection and also groups like this today that uh, make me feel like a big part of something bigger, that um, there are so many of us, so many great women, but also men. And um, that it's uh, one of the, as I said before, one of the things in space, um, yeah, in the space community, um, that you get to know those people and you get to work together on big projects. Um, and that is one of the main things that I think we have to bring to the world back, um, that you can work together across genders, across religion, across, um, yeah, country borders. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what I always uh, feel very strongly about. Yeah, very well said, yes, well said. Um, um, yeah, I think we can, uh, we're almost at the end. It's been a very long time and long evening for Alice. We should also close soon. So, uh, anyone wants to say anything, any closing or? I, I can thank you for a very amazing, uh, webinar, uh, very interesting with a lot of important messages that we have to transfer to all our women. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anna, uh, Anna Maria. And thank you, guys, uh, everyone. We will uh, share uh, perhaps not a video recording, but just an audio recording on the VIA YouTube channel and add uh, links to all of your profiles. So I'm sure a lot of people would be interested. And thank you so much. It was absolutely awesome. You were super cool, super awesome panelists and super awesome guests. So, yeah. Thank you for having us. It was wonderful. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks a lot for the moderation. Excellent, Roshana. <laughs> it was a pleasure. It was really a pleasure. <laughs> and good luck. Good luck to everybody because I think there will be also other candidates listening to us. Yeah. Yes, good luck to everyone. Yeah, good, good luck to everyone. And yeah. uh, great. So hopefully we see each other uh, at the next conference uh, or event in person. Have a have a great uh, rest of the day, people, and uh, yeah, lots of love. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.